Let's talk about A Bridge to Babylon and the New King James Bible. And after we've done that, time permitting, let's get into the Song of Solomon. But before we start, regarding the New King James Bible and all the modern Bible translations, there are some very interesting things that I've studied and I've put in my books, and they set the foundation for all these new translations and, of course, the New King James Bible and the fact that Thomas Nelson and Rupert Murdoch and all these New Age occultists and Vatican Knights are behind these types of Bibles. And that brings to mind Manly P. Hall. I don't know if you know Manly P. Hall, but he was a very well-known educator and occultist, very powerful, very influential in the 40s, and he maintained that this change was coming. They already knew, the people in the know, and Manly P. Hall was one of them, that the change in moral values, the change in the way people saw the King James Bible, the King James Bible had to be dethroned. And he even said that in the 40s, people still believed the King James Bible was reliable. And many believed it was an infallible source of truth and morality. They may not have followed it or abided by it, but there was still that prevailing sentiment. And he said that it would take five generations to get rid of that. And what he said, and I'm going to quote him, he said this, The way of that conditioning would be the one used in Central Europe to condition Nazi minds. There the circulation of an ideology began in public schools. We would have to have five generations of the consciousness concept of democratic cooperation before we can create a world capable of mental and emotional tolerance. And what he was talking about is creating this new world order. And he said the King James Bible was standing in the way, even in 1944. And then he went on to say, in the same article, in the same newsletter, that the Codex Sinaiticus was of importance to students of occultism because it contained many passages that were suppressed from the published Gospels. And he meant the King James Bible. And he said these passages in many cases significantly alter the significance of the text. And so this occultist was favorable toward the new Bible translations and the false Bible manuscripts. And before him, Helena Blavatsky, who is known as the mother of the New Age, she endorsed Codex Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, and particularly in the context of Westcott and Hort's Greek New Testament. So these were two New Age occultists that recognized what was happening and published it, made no bones about saying this movement of New Testaments, New Greek Manuscripts, is favorable to occultism. And that, to me, sets the stage, John, for what we're going to talk about regarding A Bridge to Babylon and the information you provided about the New King James Bible and Thomas Nelson Publishers. Well, exactly, and my comments would be, just really quickly, is that the Oxford Movement starts in the early 1830s. Then you've got the Pope meeting with Tischendorf in the early 1840s. So you've got this organized effort to undermine the Christian Bible which was already compromised, as we've discussed earlier. Then it leads up to, over time, the strategic plan long-term, as you get Vatican II in the early 60s, concludes in the early 60s. And if you look at the social metrics, if you look at murder, rape, and all the things important to society's order and behavior, they all go haywire right after Vatican II concludes. And that's when all these modern translations that we have today, such as the New American Standard, or the New King James, or the NIV, they all were an output of Vatican II, taken from the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus apparatus, the manuscripts of the Vatican, call it the Nestle Allen text. We've got a Jesuit cardinal working on the United Bible Society Committee, alongside with so-called Protestants, and the world is flooded with the Vatican Bibles, under the guise of being a Christian Protestant text. And then you look at the outputs, look at what's happened. You know, we've got abortions, murder, rape going through the roof and a decay in society where you can see today the evil fruit that has happened as a result of all of this. Yes, and I think that's what Manly P. Hall was getting at, where the King James Bible and the standard that we'd learned to accept as a culture for a long time, whether or not people abided by it, that standard needed to go away so that they could create this new world order. 
And that's where the King James Bible had to be taken down. And when we're talking about these big publishers like HarperCollins, Zondervan, Thomas Nelson, they're all controlled by Rupert Murdoch. And he's a papal knight. And he's responsible for this new King James Version. And he holds the copyright to the NIV. And his media conglomerate is vast. It's worth $18, $20 billion. It's massive. And this is the kind of economic power that's behind these new Bible translations. And these are the people that Manley P. Hall and others in the occult were connected to and promoting. Exactly. And I did do a lot of the same research on the very subject matter that you're discussing in preparation for the third film in the series that I produced called A Bridge to Babylon. And in that process of researching for the film, I was able to interview Dr. Kirk DeVitro, and he told us, he told Chris Pinto, as well as myself, about a meeting, a private meeting that he had with Thomas Nelson just prior to the launch of the New King James Bible back in the very early 1980s. It was very interesting to hear what he had said. And here's another interesting fact about these publishers. Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, was published by Zondervan. Zondervan is one of Rupert Murdoch's companies. Not only that, Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life was also published by Zondervan. And we know for a fact that business people like Rupert Murdoch don't do things unless there's a very good reason. And the reason those books are published by those companies are because they're friendly toward what Rupert Murdoch has been told to do by the Vatican. He's a papal knight. He cannot have built that corporation without their support. If they don't want him to have all those companies and all that power, they can take it all away. And so these kinds of associations that we see with HarperCollins, Zondervan, and Thomas Nelson all promote the new Bible translations and the new King James Version. There's no question about it. Exactly. And in the process of my research, we identified a guy by the name of Leo Hendry, who was sitting atop of the Thomas Nelson Publishing Corporation, and he testified in the movie Tears Among the Wheat towards the end of the film that he's driven by devils in business and he's influenced by the Jesuits. He's Jesuit trained, and that's what drives him. And so this influence is very easy to see once you look for it. He says lots of demons, lots of devils that have always caused him to want to succeed. He said he was blessed with some intellect, and he had intellectual curiosity, but he's also said a lot of his early influences came from the Jesuits. He said that right into the camera. He says he was Jesuit trained at both the high school and college level, and that was a discipline and an environment that forced you to excel, rewarded you for excellence, and gave you an intellectual curiosity, and he was driven by that. Thomas Nelson obviously owns the copyright on the New King James Bible, which greatly follows the same textual pattern of the Roman text. So there's lots and lots and lots of textual changes that lined up with the Catholic Bibles in the New King James Bible, in spite of their professing that it was just a friendly update of the King James Bible. You said something about this man being intelligent or having some curiosity. And most certainly the Jesuits and the Vatican know how to capitalize on intelligent people, but it's not really a major prerequisite to climb to the top, because we see people that are not that clever or not that intelligent, they're in positions of significant power and economic success. And I know that the devil can empower people to have intelligence beyond their means. Yeah, I would agree. And I've also watched interviews where, let's just say, a famous musician testifies that, you know, an evil spirit appears at the end of their bed and tells them what business manager to hire and what they need to do in terms of their record company agenda. And they're basically just led to the path of success that they are. And at the same time, they're compromised. This is how it works, you know, what God does for his saints. There's always a counter to that where people are empowered with evil spiritual enlightenment, if that's such a term, to do work against the Lord's will. Yes, and I think the difference is if you're truly in the service of the kingdom of God, in service of Jesus Christ, it's not about money, it's not about notoriety, it's not about being accepted. It's not about any of those things. It's the antithesis 
of what you see in Satan's kingdom. Those who want to rise up in Satan's kingdom want to rise up for money, power, prestige, all the wrong things. And so when we look at what's happening in the so-called Christian community and we see all these so-called great Christian leaders rising up in the ways of the world, we have to know that they're in the service of Lucifer because Jesus said the love of money is the root of all evil. And he said it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. He's very clear about the separation of these two kingdoms and the motives by which people do things. And when I look at what's happening in the publishing world, I think you and I could write the absolute definitive and best book ever written comparing the real authorized King James Bible, the one that we talk about, comparing that to the corrupt King James Bible, and we could meticulously footnote that book. It could be perfect, and no major publisher would touch it because it's not your best life now. It's not your purpose-driven life. It's not phony prophecy books like Hal Lindsey writes. You have to write what they want. It has to be their agenda. And if it's not, they won't publish it. And the things they've published... I've read Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth. That book sold 30 million copies. It is poorly written. It's poorly organized. It's a piece of literary junk. It's a piece of theological junk. It's garbage on every level. Yet that's something they published. Yet if you and I wrote a really good book, Bible Comparisons, the authorized 1611 against the Blaney edition, they wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. And I received a very cold reception to when I was involved in doing the film series, uh, Lamp in the Dark, Tears Among the Wheat, and A Bridge to Babylon. There was absolutely no interest on anyone's part to explore the differences between what everybody thinks the King James Bible is and the actual Bible that King James authorized, because they're two completely different testimonies, and the Holy Spirit will point that out to people. And I'd also like to comment that Jesus Christ, in addition to saying the love of money is the root of all evil, he says, buy the truth, sell it not. And he also says in Matthew chapter 10, freely ye have received, freely give. So the Holy Spirit has a conviction of giving freely to those that are seeking God's wisdom, are seeking the truth of Jesus Christ our Lord. And I've never felt any conviction to profit myself from any of the work that I've done for the Lord. It's all been something joyfully done because I've received the Holy Spirit, and I want others to receive what I've received from the Lord. And that is, you know, the comfort of the Holy Spirit and a real edification that can only be done by the true Word of God being taught by the Holy Spirit. That's something that I want to share with everyone. I can't profit off of something that I didn't do. Is there anything else, John, you want to say about A Bridge to Babylon and the New King James Version and what went on around that particular situation? Okay, what I'd like to do is talk about when I interviewed Kirk DeVitro. Kirk DeVitro, Chris Pino, and myself, we met sometime early on in 2008. And during the interview, Kirk DeVitro told us that he had met with Thomas Nelson. He was invited to a private meeting before they launched the New King James And at this meeting, he was told by a representative of the company, they put a film strip together detailing the history of the King James Bible. And then he made a statement, and I'm talking about the representative of Thomas Nelson. Kirk DeVitro wasn't able to quote it word for word, but it was something like, hey folks, we're educated people here, and what I am about to say I would never say to our people, but we all know that the King James Bible is an inferior translation based on inferior text. But every time we have attempted to give your people a more accurate Bible, they won't accept it. And that was understood to be in reference to modern translations. So we've gone back into the King James Bible and have introduced a few changes in the name of modernizing it to provide you with a transitional bridge to get your people from the King James Bible so eventually they will accept a more accurate Bible. And then Kirk DeVitro told me, once he heard that, he never really gave the New King James Bible a fair hearing because he felt it was launched and based on deceitful purposes. And so we went on to interview him, and he told us that they had almost a pompous attitude that what they're trying to do is just create a bridge to yet another translation or another Bible that they wanted people to receive. And of course, if you examine the New King James, 
what it is is it appears to be a, a hybrid between, let's say, a, a pure Vatican-type Bible like the New American Bible or the NIV and the Blaney KJV. They combined them all together, and what resulted was the New King James Bible, which has fewer departures, but yet a lot of departures from the received text. Yes, the New King James Version is sold on the basis that it's the same thing. This is what the publishers say. It's the same thing as the authorized King James Version, except we've updated the language. There's no these and thous and things like that. And that's the least of the problems in the New King James Version, although that is a significant problem too, because as soon as you take out the these and thous, you distort the plurality of the pronouns. That is, who is Jesus talking to? Is it one person? Is it a whole bunch of people? There is no complication in understanding these and thous. That does not make it hard to read. But they've sold people the idea that when you see thee and thou, now you can't understand what the Bible is saying. That's a very simple problem to solve by learning the difference. And this idea of dumbing things down is part of what modern culture is all about anyway. People don't read. People want a McDonald's version of the Bible. And so give them what they want. And that's the philosophy of the publishers. They're playing on that sentiment. And the New King James Version can easily be sold to somebody who says, oh, I believe in the King James Bible. And they don't know why they believe in it, but they say, these and thous, oh, you took those out? Oh, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. So they give that Bible to their children. Now their children are reading this New King James Bible, which has other distortions. And it is fundamentally based on Sinaiticus and Vaticanus with a bit of a flair for the authorized King James Bible. But the agenda is clearly based on those Alexandrian manuscripts. I completely agree and I want people to know that when you have the Holy Spirit, and we were talking about this earlier, I can read through the New King James, and I've done that. You know, I can make countless notations as far as the actual words that were changed to specifically break the prophecies that God is teaching us out of the authorized version of 1611. I could come up with thousands of deliberate changes. There's so many of them in the words themselves. But when you have the Holy Spirit, you've overcome the world. And God gives you that spiritual insight so that you can do that. A natural person can't do that. If you're not saved or if you have a spirit of slumber, you're not going to be able to see that. But if you do have the Holy Spirit in you and somebody witnesses to you, there should be some conviction that, hey, we have a problem. Let's draw near to God, pray, and ask him to lead us to all truth because we trust in him. The Bible says, my people perish for lack of knowledge and they have rejected knowledge. And it's the rejection of knowledge that's even more significant. It's to say you've been presented with the knowledge and you've chosen to reject it. You know what the truth is, but you're rejecting it for whatever reasons. And I know how true that is. I had a conversation with a woman one day who set herself up as a Bible teacher and she thought that this gave her some kind of status. So I said, well, which Bible are you teaching out of? Well, it turned out it was either the ESV or the RSV. And I said, tell me who appeared in the furnace in Daniel. Daniel chapter 3, I think, verse 25. And she said, oh, well, that would have been Jesus. I said, turn in your Bible. It said, a son of the gods. I said, well, why aren't you teaching what your Bible teaches? Your Bible teaches that it was a son of the gods. The gods would be fallen angels. I said, why aren't you teaching what your Bible teaches? Well, she started scratching her head because she realized that came from the King James Bible. That doctrine that she was teaching was not in her Bible. And I said, don't you think you ought to change Bibles? And she wouldn't change. She wouldn't listen. That's a spirit of pride and arrogance. She knew the truth. She heard the truth. Yet she wouldn't change. And, you know, I question, how can you say someone's saved if there's no conviction there? Is God hardening their heart? I don't know. But he must be. But hopefully they'll wake up and they'll have oil in their lamp so that they can get into the wedding, <laughs> as it says in Matthew chapter 25. What I care is that the truth is presented and that people who are in the darkness come to the light. It's not an issue of, well, I'm right and you're not right. Yet it becomes that for many people because they're so caught up in their ego and the arrogance and the pride that they have in their position. Well, I'm a pastor, I'm a scholar, I have a PhD in this, that, and the other. I'm all these things. 
So as soon as they come in contact with the truth, that spirit of pride prevents them from accepting that knowledge. Yeah, and God calls it a crown of pride, and he also talks about how thy crowned are as locust. In other words, if you're in a position of influence and you're filled with pride and you've got your own wisdom and understanding that is not compatible with God's, then you're going to be casting doubt and eating up all the spiritual food as you were a locust out eating up the crops in the field. I mean, people are famished because they haven't been fed the Word of God. And Jesus Christ, as we've talked about before, he speaks about when he returns, will he even find faith? When the Son of Man returns, shall he find faith on the earth? Yeah, that's the real reality that we're looking at. But it's that same spirit in the institutional church of Jesus' time. It's that same spirit in those people that crucified Jesus Christ, that set up the kangaroo courts to try him at the temple and have him turned over to the Romans. They said of Jesus, well, what does he know? He's not educated. He's a carpenter. He makes tables and chairs. And who are these raggedy followers of his, these disciples, these ignorant fishermen? They're not literate. They've not been trained up. They know nothing. That was the view that the modern church at Jesus' time, the synagogue, had of the words of Jesus and his disciples. It's no different today. The people that are in those positions of power don't want to hear from somebody like Jesus or his bedraggled disciples that just got off a ship smelling of fish. Yet they marveled at the knowledge they had. And when the people said of Jesus, he speaks with authority, not like the scribes and Pharisees. This was something that presented such a challenge to the academic minds of the day. And here we are in exactly the same position. We have an institutional church that embraces exactly the same values as the synagogue did. It was all about the building, the gold dripping off the building. It was all about the intelligentsia. It was all about the important people. And they didn't recognize Christ because they didn't want to. Here we have the same problem today. Yes, our fallen nature is such that we have the same set of problems irregardless of the time period. I completely agree. Let's talk a little bit about Song of Solomon. I don't know how far we can get into it, but I know you've done some very serious study of this book. Tell us a little bit about chapter 1 and the setup. Who are the characters? What's going on here? What's the dynamic between the two principal characters? And what are they trying to say to each other? And how does this relate to what we find in the 1611? The 1611 has some notes that indicate that they perhaps thought it was a picture of Jesus Christ and his church. The notes say Christ and the church, okay? And it's implied that it might be Jesus Christ, but it's actually accurate to say it's allegorical for Christ and the church. But then what you have to do is you have to have the text that was authorized and produced in 1611, because it is different, albeit so subtly different, from what is published today by Thomas Nelson or Zondervan when they put out their Blaney KJV. Okay, the serpent is subtle. So I'd like to set the song up, and this may be offensive, but here's what the 1611 Bible says. There's a cast of characters. You've got the Daughters of Jerusalem. You've got Solomon, who is a representation also of Leviathan, referenced in Job 41, and he is an Antichrist figure. You've got the King of Babylon. You've got the Queen Babylon. You can learn more about the Queen, especially in Revelation chapter 17 and 18, but all throughout the rest of the Bible. And then in the song, there's some key definitions. Anytime my beloved is spoken in the song, it's the woman referring to the man, which is typically Solomon. Anytime my love is stated, it's Solomon referring to the woman. If it says my soul love, it refers to the woman referring to the love of her soul, behemoth, when referring to him, she calls him my love as compared to my beloved for Leviathan, which is Solomon. And then when it says, oh, beloved, that's the description of the woman by her friend, which is now a compilation between Behemoth and Leviathan, the king of Babylon and the prince of Babylon, fulfilled the prophecy in Hosea chapter 3. So that's something that really you need to be a saved Christian and you need to be off of milk and onto solid food and in the 1611. And then the Holy Spirit will lead you to that conclusion. Don't take my word for it. That's what it says. But then in chapter 1, the Babylonian church, which is also called the horse leech, is seduced by Solomon. And they conclude. 
conclude the chapter by confessing they have a new Bible or book of wisdom to join them in love. And Solomon is actually getting, we'll say, drunk or high off of the wisdom of Lucifer in the song. Now, this might be mind-boggling to people, but I would ask everyone listening, keep in mind, God's Word is a spiritual testimony, and it cannot be leavened. You can't add to or diminish from any words that he has spoken. And if the words are different in the Bible that I'm referring to, the 1611, from somebody using a King James, they need to understand that any change, a little leaven, leaven it the whole lump. So then you go throughout chapter 1, and what it is is it's a cross-reference to all these other places in the Bible where the Holy Spirit has already taught people about what's going on. And I could go verse by verse and list all the other verses. I don't want to come across as too much like, uh, you know, a Jack Van Impey where he's just quoting scriptures here and there. But you've got the daughters of Jerusalem starting out in verse 2, talking, and then Solomon picks it up in verse 5. And then you've got an exchange where the queen comes in in verse 7. Then Solomon responds in verse 8. And you've got this back and forth exchange where throughout the chapter we find that they are producing a bed of love, a Bible, that they can all agree with and share each other's love because God is love and the king of Babylon wants to be like the Most High. So that's going on. I've got published apologetics on the Internet that go through verse by verse and all the cross-references to other places in the Bible. And when I've showed this to people who are saved, they get a conviction. They're like, yes, now I can understand. And I'll give one quick example uh, that's real easy. It's, a, it's like a beginner level understanding. If you go to chapter 2 and you look at the exchanges, the queen starts by speaking in verse 1. She's introducing herself as the Rose of Sharon and the Lily of the Valleys. And then Solomon speaks in verse 2, and he's describing the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters, because when it says my love, it's the man referring to the woman. And then the queen speaks again in verse 3, and she keeps talking all the way through verse 6. And she speaks something in verse 4 where she said, He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. That whole lesson comes from Daniel chapter 5, where the queen of Babylon is drawn to the banqueting house by reason of the words of the king of Babylon. So there's a lot more going on in the song than what most people realize. And then she says, stay me with flagons, which are containers of typically wine. Comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. She's sick. It's not good to be sick. Jesus came to heal the sick. This is all cross-referenced like in Isaiah chapter 1 or Hosea chapter 7. And then he's holding her up. She is actually sick and drunk in his arms. And it says, she testifies, his left hand is under my head and his right hand doth embrace me. And then he speaks in chapter, or in verse 7, I'm sorry. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that stir not up nor awake my love till she pleads. Now that's a critical testimony because Solomon is talking about the woman that's drunk in his arms, referring to the church of Babylon, which is drunk. The whole world is drunk on all these modern Bibles by reason of the words of the king, the king of Babylon. It's all coming from Lucifer and all this corruption and nonsense. So the song is so powerful. God wrote his word like an onion. There's layer after layer after layer. You get the literal, and then you start getting spiritual layers of testimonies going on here. And when you have this, you realize that throughout the rest of the song, it's about the building of the abomination of desolation or about the building of something that is so offensive to God. It is a, an imitation of his pure words. And as a result, the world is drunk and ultimately perishes because of this. Where else would God put arguably one of the most powerful books of prophecy in the entire Bible than smack dab in the center of it? under the guise of, oh, it's a love song, it's allegorical between Christ and the church and stuff. This is where the wisdom of the Holy Spirit is so powerful because you cannot get this without the Holy Ghost teaching you from the true text. So if you're a saved Christian, a beloved Christian of the Most High, but somebody gives you a Blaney Bible and it says falsely, tell he please, how do you know what's going on? Is Solomon holding a man? What's happening? It makes no sense.
the Blaney creates a train wreck because it says, nor awake my love till he please, which implies that Solomon is having some kind of a homosexual relationship with a man. And the original 1611 has the word she, my love till she please. Now that makes sense, but that word has been changed. And at that point in Song of Solomon, the whole thing starts to make no sense. And most people who read the Song of Solomon don't read it very often, and they don't get it. And it's because of things like that. And the other thing that you'd mentioned in one of our earlier conversations, chapter 2, verse 1, Lily of the Valleys. There's a so-called hymn called Lily of the Valley. And that designation is given to Christ. When in fact, Song of Solomon, Lily of the Valley, is not Jesus Christ. Yes, there were occult circumstances surrounding that song when Charles Fry, I believe that's who penned the song, he testified about, you know, I can't remember if it was an apparition or something, but it was very strange, but it makes no sense at all. He obviously, if he was using any Bible at that time, it was corrupt. It was either a Blaney KJV or it could have been part of the revised version that he was subscribing to. What happens is you get these hymns in your Christian hymnals that make no biblical sense. Jesus is not the lily of the valley. No, the devil's not holding Jesus drunk in his arms. It just goes on and on and on. And then to further blaspheme things, you get these modern Bibles. The scholars aren't sure. They really don't know Hebrew. So instead of he please or she please, now it's it please. What is it? Is it a transgender or is it a concept? What is it? Because it's supposed to be a woman. But now what you're doing is you're saying, okay, it. We really don't know what it is, but it's just it because we can't figure it out. So you change one word in the testimony and it leavens the whole lump. And none of us, saved or unsaved, are going to escape the pure words of Jesus when fire comes out of his mouth and tries our works. We are all going to have to subscribe to what his pure words say. So you better be compliant with the true word of God rather than putting your trust in the scribes or scholars. Exactly. When I started reading Song of Solomon many years ago, I didn't understand a word of it. And I was reading it in the Blaney edition. And a few months before I met you, I said, I really have to sort this book out. So I had another go at it. And still reading the Blaney edition, I found it extremely frustrating. And I said to myself, I don't get this. When you talk to me about what's been changed in the Blaney edition, then the light went on, because as soon as I knew, those small pronouns send you off in a direction that you can't reconcile. You cannot make sense of this book if the pronouns are changed. And if you have a mindset that is conditioned to hear the song, He's the Lily of the Valley, you can't reconcile this material with the person of Jesus Christ. It doesn't work. In fact, a lot of the material in the 1611 You're talking about Antichrist and Mystery Babylon. The only way to make sense of this book is to have the right text. I don't know anybody except you who really has done the kind of study on this book that needs to be done. As we go through the phrases, my love and my beloved, this is the conversation between the man and the woman. And that goes on pretty much through the whole book. Is that right? That is correct. And what's very important to understand is what I mentioned earlier. The Holy Spirit defines who is speaking in every verse, and it's not privately interpreted because it's all cross-referencing other places in the Bible. There are stories within stories in the Bible. So if a queen is coming into the banqueting house or whatever, where is that happening somewhere else in Scripture? Because the prophets are always going to give testimonies of the same thing so that you don't get a cult-like interpretation. But being sick of love and being stayed with flagons, does God say that that's a good thing or a bad thing somewhere else in the Bible? That's the question. You know, so any time that someone wants to contend over this, I have to ask, well, are you saved, number one? And number two, what is God teaching you about the song throughout the rest of the Bible? That's the key. There's one thing that you and I talked about in chapter 3, verse 5. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up, nor awake my love, till he please. Can you explain why in this one verse the pronoun he and my love are together? Absolutely. Uh, 
uh, and you're referring to chapter 2, verse 7? Uh, chapter 3, verse 5. Chapter 2, verse 7 is, My love till she please. Then chapter 3, verse 5 is, My love till he please. Oh, yes, that's easily explained because in chapter 3, the queen starts to talk and she is on her bed and she's talking about seeking out whom her soul loved. Okay, so she's not looking for her beloved. She's looking for the love of her soul, which God being representative of three, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, there's three parts to God, but there's also three parts to emulating God or being like the Most High. So now she's looking for, we'll call him God the Father, the love of her soul, as opposed to the beloved Son, whom with the Father is well pleased. So knowing that that's the setup, in the chapter, it changes the meaning a little bit because the watchmen that go about the city find her and she said, saw him whom my soul loveth. She's not looking for her beloved. She's looking for whom her soul loveth. And then what she does is she finds him and brings him to her chamber and she holds on to him. So she's holding a man in her arms, and that's why it says in verse 5, I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that you stir not up nor awake my love till he please, because she's the one that's awake, and he's the one that she finds and drags to her chambers. So once you know that, then it's crystal clear as to what is happening. It makes full sense. Excellent explanation. John, let's leave it there. If we need to clarify this further next time around, we can do that. But I think that's really obvious from the text that, in fact, she's addressing somebody else or something else. Mm-hmm.